Thank you, Peter, for a fascinating talk. You know, one thing I've got to ask you about, what is the risk of a virus emerging sometime soon, which has the three fundamental properties? First of all, it must be spread by airborne and contact. Secondly, it must have a long latency period, where Ebola, I think it's about 21 days, if I'm correct, AIDS is 10 years. If Ebola, its latency period had been six months, or six, or worse still, 12 months, that would have gone further. And then the mortality rate must be very high. What chance do you think a, an influenza-type virus could evolve in the next five to 10 years with all those three fundamental properties? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to it. I mean, it's, theoretically it's possible, but when it hasn't happened yet. Um, but uh, when you look, uh, HIV is probably the most successful virus because of the long latency period. It's actually not that infectious. Through a single sexual contact, uh, the chance is not so high to get it. But yet, you know, you've, in 10 years' time, you can have a lot of sex partners and infect too many people. But it's the respiratory virus that are really the ones that create these huge outbreaks and so on. Frankly, I'm not so concerned about Ebola because you need close contact. It's really bad to have it, and so, but it can be contained. But, uh, but there, are, there is quite, a, quite some controversial research that is uh, happening and is trying to, um, to, to study how viruses can... Uh, what, what, what does it make to make them more lethal or, um, you know, um, um, or change their mode of transmission, which means new receptors for new cells. But it's a, that's a, the key question. The next question, please. Uh, the lady, just there, please. Um, you briefly mentioned about the sort of fruit bats and their incredible biology in terms of being able to host all these amazing diseases um, and not catch any of them. Do you think there's any sort of point in researching further into kind of other kind of animals or organisms that have sort of these resistances or almost what we might call kind of superpowers against, you know, diseases? Or do you think it's more worth kind of doing sort of shorter term kind of infrastructural type um, progression towards protecting from the next epidemic? Yeah, no, that's a good question because we, we, we're now moving into what we call One Health. And that in order to, for example, for influenza, in order to know where is the next epidemic, what's the next type of uh, influenza virus that's coming up, the best information is not to follow people or what's going on, but it's uh, chickens and uh, birds and so on. And so we're working more and more, there's more and more co collaboration between the, the veterinary world and the human health world. But that's new. And uh, like at our school, we even have now masters in um, in One Health, and, um, but there are no jobs in One Health, to be honest. Uh, so, um, but that's what we need, and so to integrate, because we know from bats, but we know that but there is no systematic uh, surveillance, and, but there is systematic surveillance in, certainly in China, for example, and in Hong Kong, of um, what's going on in poultry, and if in the... Um, in Asia, in many parts of Asia, or East Asia, people like to um, buy their um, meat, their pull, their, their chickens live. And that's actually, I can understand that, and you know it's fresh. Um, but so there are massive markets, and uh, uh, if, the, if there is mortality detected in chickens, then that triggers uh, immediately um, some also a response from on the, on the human side. So the answer is yes, but we, we still have a long way to go. Yeah. Okay, next question. I'll take the gentleman in the middle here, please. Mm. Firstly, thank you very much for your talk. It was very good and informative. Um, you mentioned quite quickly the CEPI, and you moved on very quickly. I was just wondering if you could explain or elaborate a little bit more about sort of how the mechanisms work, why suddenly private corporations would be interested, and also perhaps explain a little bit about how successful it's been? Yeah, I, I, I looked at the watch and that's why it was getting faster because I was told one hour, not more. Um, uh, yes, so the, um, 
after the um, epidemic, or it was still not over, in 2015, uh, let me just make sure I got this right. No, or 2016 in January, I convened a meeting in Davos at the World Economic Forum with um, the CEOs of um, pharmaceutical companies, um, the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, Jeremy Farrer was there, um, ministers of cooperation, and I said, okay, we've got a problem. We need vaccines for these uh, epidemics because they will come up again and again. Um, however, um, there is no market incentive. So how are we going to do that? You pharma companies, you biotech companies, you've got to know how. You know how to make vaccines. Um, but your shareholders may not necessarily be interested in it. Um, so, and then there is a need. And uh, everybody said, yes, let's do it. And it took a, um, a year, only a year, which is record time, because a year later, in, in 2017, um, we could announce and we could launch CEPI with about more than half a billion uh, dollars in, um, in cash. Um, and um, we agreed also on a few things. One, that the, it would be a big tent. Everybody is part of the solution should be in that tent. And that's not so easy because it was driven on the government side by Norway, Germany, Japan, and India. And then we've got uh, some companies, big and small, MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, um, you know, was in the governments, governance, sorry. And um, um, they're usually not always, you know, they have campaigns against, uh, you know, expensive medicines and so on for access. So it was a, quite a remarkable coalition, which uh, keeping that together is not easy, but it's necessary. And um, then we agreed on priorities. I mentioned three uh, viruses, um, Lhasa, uh, Nipah, and um, uh, MERS. So we agreed that's because we can't do everything. 500 million sounds a lot of money, which it is, but in order to develop a vaccine, we're talking about a few hundred million for each one, uh, and you don't know where it will work. And how is it doing? Um, all I can say, because it's only um, a good year old, um, that contracts are out, um, that, um, you know, biotechs and so on, they're, they're working on, these, on developing these vaccines. And the and part of your question was, why would uh, big pharma or pharma do it? I think that um, the, the ones who were active in the um, uh, Ebola outbreak, they did it because they thought it was the right thing to do. And they could afford it because they make profit from other things. Um, but it, we're, we're talking really about hundreds of millions that were uh, invested from their side, and they will, uh, unlikely that they will get any return. Um, but you can't expect them to do that every time there's an epidemic. So that's why we need a, a, a mechanism uh, like that. Um, and also, the, we have agreement on uh, intellectual property, on um, access, uh, all that. I mean, it would be another talk. But, uh, but I, I think it could be a model for other things also, um, you know, for development of, uh, um, of products that benefit people, um, but where there's no market incentive. And we, we need that for the quite a few um, uh, public-private partnerships, like to develop vaccines. Um, drugs against malaria. In Japan, there's the Global Health Innovative Technology Fund, which is concentrating on uh, neglected tropical diseases. So it is starting to be a, um, a system or systems that try to address that, but it's not enough yet. Okay, next question. Gentlemen, just at the front here. Can we use the microphone, though, please, uh, for the benefit of others after this event, as much as today. Thank you. Professor, you um, touched on the huge cost of developing drugs as one of the impediments to co commercial companies developing. Do you have any ideas as to how this barrier could be lowered to make it easier for companies to do this? Yeah, that's exactly what we... Um, for vaccines, I think we found a... I'm not saying a solution, but a, a really a, an interesting path for that benefits society and that also is attractive to, to companies. Um, not to make money, but uh, I think they, they just uh, have a, a way to, to channel the, you know, their, their knowledge and sound to the benefit of people. For drugs, um, 
It depends. Like when you take HIV, um, in the beginning, the drug was so expensive and uh, therefore not accessible to people. Today, when a new antiretroviral drug, a drug that treats HIV infection, is put on the market, nearly every single um, pharmaceutical company will have differential prices, high-income markets and for low-income markets, and a system of uh, uh, licensing to particularly um, Indian generic manufacturers. Most people in Africa on antiretroviral drugs are taking uh, Indian drugs. I take statins, and I note from the NHS, well, that's uh, made by an, uh, an Indian generic company. So it's not only for, uh, you know, um, for antiretrovirals. But so I think that's a, a big change. And in 2000, and, um, was it two or three, the rules for um, the TRIPS agreement, which is the trade-related intellectual property uh, rules um, of the World Trade Organization, were changed in Doha, the meeting in Doha, um, specifically to address the issue of public health emergencies. For, and that was for HIV, so that a country could import generic versions, so copies of a drug that's still under patent for a, um, uh, a public health emergency, provided some fair compensation was there, but, but at prices that are way below. So we're going to slowly to a different system. But there are today, let's say, when you take the most expensive therapies today are for cancer or for some rare diseases, and, uh, and where we had real breakthroughs in treatment of cancer. Can we apply a similar system or not? So, uh, so it is, uh, I, it's very high on my personal agenda. Yeah. One final question, please. We'll take the lady um, just here, please. So you mentioned that in yeah. you mentioned in the 1976 outbreak, you had to go through all the books to try and find the virus, whereas with the more recent outbreaks of Ebola, you could just kind of use technology and you could have results within a day. Yes. Where do you kind of see technology going forward in kind of regards to finding out and being able to provide cures for these diseases? Yeah, I think, good question, because I think their technology, and let's take to just one aspect of it, and that's diagnosis, and that's what we need is a, a, what we call point-of-care diagnostics. I mean, it would make a huge difference if, um, I mean, let's say in an ideal world, you know, with, your, with a smartphone, you can touch someone's hand and you say, oh, you've got Ebola and you don't have it. So, no, but I mean, these things are not science fiction. They may come and... Uh, so that's what I, I think that uh, uh, is important. We, I've seen that with malaria. <clears throat> Today, um, there are uh, so-called rapid tests for malaria diagnosis, and uh, um, which in some countries where malaria is on the decline, um, the, the old paradigm where you say someone, a child has, sorry, sorry, a child has fever, the reflex was malaria, give treatment for malaria. That is no longer the case. So you can apply with a, it still requires blood, but a, a you know, finger prick, and you can see in about 20 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Where so that's the, I think, uh, for me, that would be a, a, quite a priority. Um, and then there is vaccine development. One of the, uh, the challenges that we have is that for this CEPI uh, construction, um, we have the... Um, Known knowns and the unknown knowns and so on, uh, you know, but for developing a vaccine. But for there are two big questions. One, we need a so called universal flu vaccine. What does that mean? That so instead of having requiring every single year a new vaccine that is a little bit different and protects us against the new strain, if we could have a vaccine that protects against any influenza strain, that is a huge need. And secondly, um, is what to do when there's a completely new virus that pops up, like HIV, coming out of the blue, or MERS and so on. It takes a long time to develop a vaccine. And so can we develop technological platforms, techniques that can speed up the development of vaccines? And, uh, and that's, that's a really hot topic where, yeah, uh, several academic groups, uh, particularly Oxford Imperial at our school and also at the... Uh, companies are working on. 
So, Peter, um, I'd like to thank you so much indeed for the most stimulating uh, discourse. Any discourse, by the way, that ends with a question which you have just posed is actually always wonderful because that is actually what constitutes real research. There is no end, uh, that we are always looking for more. Now, for those of you with a keen ear, um, I've really enjoyed this evening and un unsurprisingly, uh, a series uh, here at the Royal Institution of Discourses and Events. There is a thread between them. So if you recall back to uh, the, the May discourse, which was uh, given on the topic of the physics of hot air. Um, well, in fact, <laughs> we have heard this evening about the role of actually the, the transport uh, and therefore air being in that, uh, in that sort of regard. And in fact, I still recall um, the story, uh, which was in Hong Kong, uh, and actually it was an air vent that was uh, a very significant uh, player in the spread of that disease and actually they isolated it to one particular apartment um, and on a more light-hearted note I also enjoyed uh, this evening um, the exposition regarding the phylloxera and although we were talking about the demise of the wine um, again that is related to other discourses namely the previous one uh, for indeed there are other cures for uh, sort of managing the demise of wine, in this case it's frost, uh, and using sort of the treatment of helicopters and blowing air onto the vineyards to try and at least protect our beloved uh, vines. So with that, with, with that in mind, Peter, I am going to ask you to join me uh, shortly for a glass of that very substance. <laughs> and I wish you uh, to thank you for a wonderful evening. And if you could all join me in our traditional way of thanking Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much.